Hi loves, welcome to Humanitarian Chronicles where I highlight extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. I'm Abby Lodmer, conscious comedian, health coach, life coach, and I'm here today with the incredible Dr. Richard Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz is the author of Judaism and Vegetarianism, Judaism and Global Survival, Mathematics and Global Survival, and Who Stole My Religion? Revitalizing Judaism and Applying Jewish Values to Help Heal Our Imperiled Planet. He is the associate producer of the documentary A Sacred Duty, Applying Jewish Values to Help Heal the World. He is the President Emeritus of the Jewish Vegetarians of North America, President of the Society of Ethical and Religious Vegetarians, and a member of so many other upstanding animal, human, and earth-honoring organizations. He is a Professor Emeritus of Mathematics at the College of Staten Island. He has been the Jewish Vegetarian of the Year and has been inaugurated into the North American Vegetarian Society's Hall of Fame! Dr. Schwartz is absolutely living the teachings of Judaism and every ism more than truly anyone else I know, and he is one of my real life heroes. It is my absolute honor to welcome you to the show. Thank you for being here, Dr. Schwartz. Okay, well, it's really a pleasure. That was really a wonderful, wonderful introduction. Really appreciate it. Although I have to tell you, you left out some of the most important things. Why? <laughs> I'm wearing a special tie as <laughs> a vegetarian, and some people are not satisfied with that. So uh, I have also this one. Uh, I hope you can see it okay with the. This is one of the vegetables. Oh I don't tell everybody this, but you know, if you eat these fruits and vegetables for a hundred years, I guarantee you'll live a long time. Oh you know, my so, gosh. So, but there's even more here. I love it. What? Oh my gosh, you are amazing. Pull the rabbits out of the hat. Reminds me of a veggie and all. And the last one you're going to have to take my word for, but I'm wearing Fruit of the Loom underwear. <laughs> and if anybody ever said Dr. Schwartz, because of all of his many accomplishments, is a stiff guy. Think again. He is living life to the fullest. Look at what a vegan diet and a compassionate heart breathes. This amazing, lighthearted, funny, fun-loving human angel. You are the best. You are the best. You've given me an unbelievable, beautiful introduction and all, but you haven't got to the real essence because here it is right here. When we had my 80th birthday celebration this was the cover of the journal that uh, came out and that was a couple of years ago and uh it's a nice celebration with jewish vegetarians in north america oh. but the problem is nowadays as you probably know we have all these cell phones and things there's very few cell, uh, telephone booths out there so it's very hard for me to change into my superman costume <laughs> Well, now you know, people. Now you know. Dr. Schwartz is an absolute superhero. Now you know. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you filled in the blanks. What would I do without you? Please. We need to know who you are so people keep watching because this is the most amazing man. He is truly... Dr. Schwartz, Richard, if you will, is calling us to apply basic Jewish teachings, which are basically the same teachings in every religion, to our lives more than ever before. And he's doing it dressed down, dressed up with the tie, but dressed down because he is Superman. So now you know there are no phone booths. You can't see who this man really is, but we're going to get the gist in a little bit Well, as I, as I pick his brain. His beautiful brain, not the fruits of his labors, but his brain. But actually, I have to say, I give presentations all over the world about certain topics, and one of my main ones is called... Torah and veganism, or Torah and health, depending on which synagogue needs me to play it down. <laughs> and I got so much of my information from you, Dr. Schwartz, from your articles and your books and your lifetime of work compiling this important information. So you really are Superman in my eyes, and you are my real-life superhero. So there you have it. 
There you <laughs> have really it. We appreciate that. You made it hard now. You have a lot to live up to. And I <laughs> hope I can uh, live up to halfway to uh, all your many compliments. And oh, well, many you're living things. it. Also, I should point out the wonderful work you're doing. And uh, you should be blessed for many more years. And uh, continue success because... As you know, in every every way, we've got to get this message out that veganism is the ideal diet. It's certainly very consistent with Judaism, and it's especially important now, as very unfortunately the world heads toward a climate catastrophe. So I'm just so happy to be on your program, and I hope hope we can get the message out, and that people will build on what we're doing and go even further. It's it's super super important nowadays. I I could not agree more. And I love that, you know, it's been said throughout the ages, begin where you are, start at home. And that's exactly what you're doing by calling to action your own Jewish people of your birth and all religious people in your books and in your articles. You, you, It's a call to all spiritual people and spiritual leaders to rise up, step it up and do what is right and holy and compassionate for all beings, including our living, breathing, life-giving Mother Earth. And basically live a Jewish, a vegan, sorry, not Jewish, a vegan life. But I, but I do have a question about the Jewish part of you. How do you reconcile being an observant Jew with being a vegan? Because I, I struggle with that daily. Okay, well, as you pointed out, I have a whole book on that, Judaism and Vegetarianism. And the way at the beginning was what I called a leap of faith. Because unfortunately, uh, there's much in the Torah about eating of meat and all, well, though it's actually a concession, but there's so much in Judaism about compassion, about sharing, about justice, so that uh, it definitely had a case. But I do, in the book and much of my writings, I say there's at least six very powerful mandates in Judaism. These are not just side issues, fundamental, and that is we should take care of our health, which is arguably the most important mitzvah or commandment, because without taking care of our health, it's hard to do other mitzvot. And to show compassion for animals, to be co-workers with God in preserving the environment, to conserve natural resources, because animal-based diets are very wasteful to use far more water, land, energy, and other resources. Brains. And to help hungry people, because incredibly, 70% of the grain produced in the United States is fed to animals destined for slaughter. Really incredible. It makes it even more shameful. We take very healthy products, corn, oats, grain, soy products, high in complex carbohydrates and fiber, and devoid pretty much of uh, cholesterol and uh, saturated fat. And then we, in fact, put it through the animal and get just the opposite, very unhealthy product. So those are five. Or six. The last one is to seek and pursue peace. Yes. And I'd be happy to explain, you know, give what the Jewish teaching is for each one of them and how it is very seriously violated by animal-based diets and agriculture. Amen. You are so on point. And those are just six, the six Jewish mandates. That's not including the 613 commandments. And I want to touch on what you said. Eating meat, according to the Torah, is a concession. It's not a commandment. It's not even really, it's allowed but it clearly states, if you read the Torah word for word, if you believe in the Torah, of course, but it clearly states that meat was not the ultimate diet. Garden of Eden is the ultimate diet. That's the ultimate. And, and I love how you point out in your writings that just in the beginning, in the garden, and at the end, in the messianic era, when the Messiah comes or the messianic age of peace comes about, everyone will be vegan. Is we were vegan in the beginning and we're going to be vegan in the end and in the middle why should we live just because it was a concession why should we live that way Let, I'm an idealist so I say like you do rise up and live an ideal life live like the Garden of Eden taking care of our uh, the animals being good stewards it didn't say domination it said dominion over the animals in the land meaning guard it well and so, yeah, like, let's live according to the garden and the messianic time and be vegan. Why are we living, like, for a concession? I don't, I don't get it. 
Mm. Yeah, well, because uh, <laughs> I drink out of the and so I say that veganism really is the ideal Jewish diet because in the two ideal times, the Jewish tradition, as I said, in the Garden of Eden, and it's the very first chapter of the Torah, chapter 1, verse 29, God's initial diet, strictly vegan, through the herbs and the fruit of the trees, etc. And then the ideal diet, as you say, the Messianic period that Jews yearn for, is again, according to Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cohen Cook, who was chief rabbi of Free State Israel, one of the great Jewish philosophers of the 20th century, and one of the great philosophers, period, not just Jewish, and he felt that that ideal time to come would be vegan as well because he based that on a powerful prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 6 to 9 in Isaiah, that in that ideal time, the wolf will draw with the lamb, the lion will stalk the ox, and no one shall hurt nor destroy in all of God's holy mountains. And he said, if uh, the lion's going to eat throat the ox, then certainly human beings should be vegans. And by the way, I just want to point out that final part, no one shall hurt nor destroy in all of God's holy mountain. That is the motto of the International Jewish Vegetarian Society, mm-hmm. centered in London since about the middle 1960s. And now... Also, they have a very nice place in Israel, a Jewish vegetarian society in the heart of Jerusalem. And as a matter of fact, I uh, just spoke there at a wonderful Tupish Bat Seder. Uh, That's why I'm wearing ago. leaves, honoring the trees. That's <laughs> amazing. True. That's so amazing. Well, I'd like to quote another very inspirational Jewish person who I consider a rabbi because rabbi just means teacher. And it is Dr. Richard Schwartz. So I I love that Rob Cook quote, and I love what Rabbi Cook stood for. And I'm going to quote somebody who I revere. So here it is, Rabbi, Rabbi, in my eyes, Dr. Richard Schwartz's long-held vision for Judaism in this time of multiple crises. And I say for all humans in this time of crises. Um, and when you say to be a Jew is, to be a spiritual, compassionate person is. So here goes. To be a Jew is to see the world through the eyes of God, to be unreconciled to the world as it is, to be discontented with the status quo, and to be unafraid to challenge it. To be a Jew is to be a co-worker with God in the task of perfecting the world, to know that the world remains unredeemed and that we must work with God to redeem it. To be a Jew is to feel deeply the harms done to others, to speak out in the face of wrongdoing, and to prod the conscience of those who passively accept the status quo. To be a Jew is to stand apart from the world, to be a nonconformist, to shout no when others murmur yes to injustice, and to actively help uplift, uplift those in need and try to correct injustices even if others stand idly by. To be a Jew is to be intoxicated with a dream of social justice, to have an abiding concern for others, and to have compassion without condescension for people who are poor, weak, and suffering. To be a Jew means to know that God's name can be sanctified by our actions and to try to live a life compatible with being created in God's image by doing justly, acting kindly, and in all ways imitating God's attributes. To be a Jew means to believe in the unlimited potential of people in spite of the evil and injustice around us and recognizing that we have been chosen to serve as an example, to strive to be a light unto the nations. To be a Jew means, of course, many specific practices concerning Shabbat, keeping kosher, and much more. It means study and worship and most of all, action and observance. It means all of these things and far more. It is not always easy to be a Jew, but it is always a very significant and worthwhile endeavor. I I love that motto mantra of yours. It is it is a masterpiece. It's an MMM, and it's I feel like you're cut from my same cloth. You are my soul brother because I feel all of those same things about what it means to be a Jew, to be a human. And our motto in Judaism, for those who don't know, is tikkun olam. It's repair the world. So how can we truly be living that when we're eating the murdered flesh of tortured, raped animals and feeding it to our children, which also, like you were talking about, degrades the earth, the environment. 
our own health and the future. I, I just, it's not, it's not congruent with our values. So I, I just love that you're speaking up about these things. It, it's so meaningful and it's so necessary at this time. Well, <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate all that. And to reinforce it, I hope that um, you... Uh, That's God you know, calling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think God is calling and saying he likes what we're saying and we got to keep doing it because this is uh, how we get a far, far better world. Anyway, right. I'd like to urge everybody seeing this Skype uh, conversation to, uh, to go out and help us spread the word. Speak to your rabbis, to your ministers, imams, or religious leaders, to your educators. Spread the word and get to the newspapers, write letters, because... You know, all the things you're saying, very positive, and what it means to be a Jew and how important it is. But again, it's especially important now because the world is heading toward a climate catastrophe. 2016 was the warmest year in recorded history since 1880 when they were first able to um, keep temperature records. And that broke the record set in 2015, previously set in 2014. So amazingly, we've now had three consecutive years of record temperature and uh, I can go on and on that uh, all 17 of the warmest years have been since 1998 so we're way up there every decade since the 70s 1970s 80s 90s has been warmer so it's a far warmer world and it's having all kinds of effects on the uh, climate more and more droughts storms floods you know, if we want a decent world for children, grandchildren, future generations, then it's essential that a major shift toward vegan diets, because many, many other things have to be done, as you know, but, but that is really essential. And so again, everybody seeing this, uh, it's urgent. Talk to people you know, your friends, your relatives, your co-workers, and spread this message much as possible. And by the way, if people want to contact me, uh, they can email me at Veggie Rich, that's B E G G I E, then R I C H, all one word, Veggie Rich, at gmail.com. And I'll be happy to send you more information. Both of my books, Jewish Judaism and Vegetarianism and Judaism and Global Survival, they're freely available at a uh, website. Jewish veg, again, one word, Jewish veg dot org. Um, and, and I'll, put, flash, I'll and put everything in the comments. I'm oh, sorry. I'll put all of this information okay. in the description. So, yes, I, I'll let you know. Richard is so readily available to answer all of your questions and quandaries and concerns and to right. reach out to spiritual leaders. And, you know, it's so, I love that you're, you're speaking about a call to action, especially to our spiritual leaders, because I'll tell you, I studied Torah for an entire year in Jerusalem with some of the most brilliant, wise, learned rabbis and rebbitsons in Israel, in the world. And I've always sought out the spiritual prophets, prophets in my life, where, throughout my life. So, and it's so disheartening to me when I'll bring up the topic of veganism and they'll say, well, good for you. That's the ideal. You're living the ideal. You're living as God intended for us all to live, honoring life on all levels through your main three-time choice, choice per day. Three times a day, what I choose to put in my mouth is affecting our planet, animals, and humans. Then they go back to stabbing their gefilte fish and eating it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, tr it's truly, it's talk with no action. And it's not what I was raised to believe that Jews are which is, you know, people of action and social justice. And, I mean, you know, Judaism brought the Ten Commandments forward. And as Hitler said, I'll bring Hitler into this, he said that one reason he hated Jews and wanted to destroy them is because they brought consciousness to the masses. And they brought morality to the masses. And he hated that. And he wrote about it and spoke about it. And he said, who are these people to tell us how to live our lives? Who are these people to give us commandments about how to treat each other with respect, love, and compassion? He wanted to live his hedonistic lifestyle and not have any god judge him 
on what he was doing. And he spoke about that. So, you know, by, by not honoring our earth, our, our animals, the fellow beings that we share the planet with and our fellow humans, we are truly, you know, not taking action steps. So it's, it's just so, it's such a conundrum and so hypocratic to me, um, that it's hypocrisy, not hypo, but yeah, it's just, it's just hypocrisy. We're all hypocrites in a lot of ways. I still have leather that I had before I went vegan, by the way, so I'm not being wasteful, but you know, we're all hypocrites on some level, but it just boggles my mind when I speak to spiritual leaders and that's the answer I get. Well, good for you. You're living the right way. We should all aspire to that. Like, what do you say to that? Yeah, well, uh, the thing is that uh, the Jews, we have a choice. You mentioned that before, that uh, there are things in the Torah that gave permission, as I said, but luckily it is a concession. So the thing is, we have that choice, but shouldn't that choice be made taking into account the highest of Jewish values? And they are, again, compassion for animals. It says, for example, Jews are to be Rachmanim b'nei Rachmanim, that is, compassionate children of compassionate ancestors, and there's much in the Torah about compassion for animals. Uh, you can't yoke and strong and a weak animal plowing in the field. You can't muzzle an ox while threshing in the field. And it's part of the Ten Commandments where it says not only are Jews supposed to rest on the Shabbat or the Sabbath day, but animals as well. And it's really a test in many ways. It's a test for leadership. Whereas it said to Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu in Hebrew, Moses, a great teacher, was chosen because he showed great compassion for animals, the same right. with King David. And it's a test for choosing a spouse in a way because it says when Abraham, Abraham in Hebrew, Abraham wanted to make sure that the Jewish condition, tradition was continued and had to find a proper wife for his son Isaac. The, son, uh, the servant Eliezer set up a test, which was when he came to the well, if women would throw water for him, and not only for him, but 10 very thirsty camels that had just crossed the desert, mm -hmm. and Rivka or Rebecca met that test. So you can see there's a lot in Judaism about compassion for animals, and again, taking care of their health, and doing things that are consistent with the environment. Again, threatened as never before by climate change, and you realize there's about 7.4 billion people in the world, but 70 billion farmed animals are slaughtered every single year. And the negative effects of that, tremendous. Water is coming more and more short, shortages of water in the world, and yet it can take as much as 13 times as much water per person on an animal-based diet and a plant-based diet. So it's really amazing in this time of crisis that our rabbis are not speaking out more. And by the way, there are some that the very strong and uh, Jewish based, formerly Jewish based in North America, has much uh, material on that. Strongly recommend that people go to the website. There is just jewishbeds.org, jewishbeds.org, and we have some wonderful new leadership there, and we're doing great things. We've got a wonderful Facebook page, new things coming out every day on that. They're using Twitter and uh, uh, it YouTube, and it, it, great, great things. And it's, it's, it's like the animal-based diet, in a way, it's madness and sheer insanity. In the world today, I mentioned before, millions of people starving. Some estimate 20 million people, 70% yes. of the grain in the U.S., as I said before, fed to animals, maybe about 40% worldwide. And water is coming short, shortages of water, and yet it's so wasteful, much of it for irrigation to grow the feed crops for animals, which of course is not even a natural diet. Cows can live on grass. It's so that's right we're feeding them grain to fatten them up quicker and I'll yeah. actually read this quote by Thich Nhat Han every day over 40,000 children die for lack of food we who overeat in the West who are feeding grains to animals to make meat are eating the flesh of these children mm -hmm. I agree yeah. I agree so if you don't care about the earth you don't care about animals 
Maybe you're a humanitarian. Maybe you want to think about these tenets of Judaism and every ism that are living the ideal because you're a humanitarian. So 40,000 children per day are dying. 20 million a year are dying because of the uneven distribution of grains and food across the world. Because we're cutting yeah. down the rainforest to feed the to grow our grain and corn to feed the cattle instead of feeding humans what they're meant to eat, which is grains. Because we humans are herbivores. We are herbivores. And if you look at our teeth, it's far from a carnivorous animal. We don't have a claws of a carnivorous animal or intestinal system. <laughs> That's right. I do. But... It's four times as long as that of a carnivorous animal per unit height. And our stomach acids. Uh, only one twentieth as strong as that of a carnivorous animal. They have a very short bowel system, meters in and out, like uh, one day. But for us, that very long winding system, which is very, very good for fruits and vegetables, other vegan food, nuts and legumes, because that gives plenty of time for all the great vitamins and minerals, other positives to be digested. But uh, very bad for the meat that can decay in our system in a long journey through our bodies. So we're very different than uh, carnivorous animals. And again, consistent with Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, God created us really as vegans, as you say. And uh, it's crazy, crazy. Now, I mentioned one other mandate for me, and I've discussed that much. And that is to seek and pursue peace. Yes. Very important. And somebody may say, wait a minute. I mean, I can understand the health issue. Of course, we know animals are mistreated. We can see the environmental connection. We know it's very wasteful. You need more water to irrigate the crops. And uh, in terms of the hungry, we've been discussing that, that, as you say, millions are starving. An estimated nearly a billion of the 7.4 billion people in the world are chronically malnourished. But the idea of seeking and pursuing peace, well, the idea there, there's two things. First, the Jewish sages saw that the Hebrew words for bread, which is lechem, and milchama, which is word for war, come from the same root. Uh, same root for bread and for war, and they deduce from that when there's a shortage of grain and other resources, people are more likely to go to war. And history has borne that out. In early biblical days, there were battles over water at the wells, and more recently, about uh, oil was so necessary in a modern society. And again, water may become the big issue, and food may become the big issue. And uh, so again, they deduced. When there's enough, more than enough, then people say, well, they're getting more than they share, but we have enough. But when it's not enough, it can make a big difference. This is why that connection between the animal-based diets and it being so wasteful and the threat of violence and war led it to that. So I've been arguing that the slogan of the peace movement and the vegetarian movement should be one and the same. I agree. It's peas. Ah, <laughs> world peas. <laughs> That's so great. I, I agree. It once, it is the world and a pea on top of it. And it was it peas on earth. Peas so, on yeah. earth. I could not agree more, Dr. Schwartz. I could not agree more. It is so important that we think of the consequences of our actions in order to be truly upstanding people and all of our I mean I love that you are such an environmentalist and you truly are you are spearheading a lot of environmental causes where you live in Jerusalem Israel I know that you're at the forefront of the of I'm not Jerusalem, I'm not far from it. Oh, near, it's, it's, oh, I'm sorry, near yeah, Jerusalem. You see the distance in what's called the Shoresh area. Oh, beautiful, in, <laughs> in the Holy Land somewhere. Oh, no, absolutely. We'll yeah, find yeah. you somewhere. But no, I love that you are spearheading and you are at the forefront of so many of the environmental movements in Israel because it truly is one and the same. To get world peace or world peace on this earth, we really need to think of the repercussions of our dietary choices. It's where it starts because that, yeah, I mean, that's the basis. All of our 
uh, aquifers and wells and groundwater supply and clean water on earth, almost all of it is now completely destroyed because it's been used to feed cattle and also because it has been tainted by cattle manure runoff. Like all of the groundwater on the planet, almost all of it is destroyed and un unpotable because of the runoff from these factory farms. So really, like these, what is at the end of our fork is truly at the, what is at the end of the road for human existence? Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and I, gun, I think what Gandhi said, that a fork can be a weapon of violence. That's taking right. Taking account. That's right. Thing, that uh, Lechem and Mokama are bred in war, so they saw that connection. Now, another connection, unfortunately, we mentioned that uh, climate, uh, the environmental effects. Now, it turns out that animal-based agriculture is a major, major contributor to climate change. The major contributor. The major <laughs> contributor, yes. There was a study at the World Watch magazine, right? And that's because methane emitted by cows and other animals as part of digestive and excretion processes is from 72 to 105 times as potent in warming the planet during the 20 years or so that methane's in the atmosphere. And so that's the climate change connection. And there were two studies we briefly go through, not from the Sierra Club, not from the people, ethical treatment of animals, but the first one is from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. And they pointed out to me an amazing thing, that animal-based agriculture emits more greenhouse gases in carbon dioxide equivalent than all the cars, planes, train, all the means of transportation worldwide combined. That's right. And then what you mentioned, the major contributor, according to a cover story in World Watch magazine by two environmentalists associated with the World Bank, again, not exactly a radical group, uh, animals and environment, the World Bank, uh, that study taking into account, for example, that tropical forests, rainforests are being cut down in order to produce grazing land and land to grow free crops for the animals so that the livestock sector is responsible for at least, according to the study, at least 51% of all human-induced greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. So that is amazing. And so that's the connection to climate change. And other people say, and it's true, there are other issues, you know, we should be concerned with, like terrorism, for example, certainly something to be concerned with. But the U.S. military and other militaries, the Pentagon, sees climate change, again, largely caused by animal-based agriculture and diets, the uh, Pentagon military sees climate change as a multiplier potentially or a catalyst for instability, yes. violence, terrorism, war, because unfortunately we ain't seen nothing yet in terms of refugee problems. There, there could be tens of millions of desperate, hungry refugees fleeing from the effects of climate change, the okay. storms, the uh, drought, the flooding, the uh, wildfires, and we've seen some of that already in uh, some countries like in the Sudan, That's where they right. have five, six years of drought, the farmers, farms fail, the farmers go into the cities, it gets more crowded. So this is uh, another reason, give peas a chance. So that we can <laughs> That's a, Who doesn't that's like peas? Who doesn't like peas? They're the staple of America. They were like the first canned food. I don't eat canned food, but who doesn't like peas? Even my dad, who hates vegetables, likes peas, for God's sakes. So, it, no, it's so important. And, you know, I'll, I'll go with Leonardo da Vinci here. As long as men massacre animals, they will kill each other. It's what you said. There's so much war and so much violence. The time will yep. come, though, when men such as I will look upon the murder of animals as they now look upon the murder of men. Leonardo da Vinci, I concur. Yep. I really hope that time comes. You're absolutely right, though. From what I've studied, the global warming is what is causing the refugees to flee because it's too hot to live where they're living. It's too hot. They can't grow the crops they used to grow anymore yep. because of the severe... Yep climate changes. So not only is it really too hot to live, but they literally cannot grow their crops anymore. They need the they need the irrigation system that Israel has, if if you ask me. But um that needs to happen. In these lands where it's become too hot to grow, there needs to be high tech 
uh, farming practices going in there. So Israel, get over there. Get over there. Do your tikkun in, in the Sudan, um, in, so in Saudi Arabia, in Syria, in all these places that are getting too hot and, and too right. violent to live. But you're absolutely right. Where people are starving, they'll act out. Where people are are dominated and abused, which is what the hurting cultures like Judaism, like Islam, like the Western culture, like the, the English culture that took over the Western world, these hurting cultures, where there is a hurting culture, there is more war, more violence, more domination of the the more mm -hmm. vulnerable beings. What we do to animals, we do to our more vulnerable beings. Women, children, gay people, all of these more vulnerable, less mainstream peoples are are getting abused and it's the same thing we do to animals what we reap we sow we we, we reap Absolutely. what we sow right right and it's not only as you say something is super hot in the drought but you look at california as an example they had a drought for a long long time and uh, the droughts and that the wildfires increased and the former governor of california said the wildfire season used to be a few months per year now it's almost all year round That's right. and then when the rain comes there's flooding and because the trees are gone from the wildfires or from mudslides now in the news right now after like five years of drought california is getting super super rain You've probably seen the news recently, one of the dams there, an earth dam is being threatened, and there's this flooding. And by the way, because the oceans have been rising, in Florida and other eastern cities in the U.S., there's flooding on sunny days because the tides have become so high, so they have tidal waves and flooding from that. So, as I mentioned, in California, really been hit so hard. And the present governor of California, Jerry Brown, has sort of summarized the whole situation. He said, humanity is on a collision course with nature. So we're seeing that in just more and more severe climate events. I and mean, we had Katrina devastating New Orleans and that whole area and other states like Mississippi nearby. And Sandy, that was so devastating here. Yeah. And you just hear so many cases where there are droughts and other cases where there's flooding so it's something where some people say well maybe in 50 years from now maybe 100 years but it's happening right now, right now. and yeah. the big big problem is the potential of a tipping point where things can spiral out of control it, the oceans only has risen by eight inches doesn't seem that much but even that can it's making these storms more severe in addition to the fact that in the warmer world there's more moisture in the atmosphere and the warmer water gives more energy to storms, so storms can be more severe. Yes. And uh, if, God forbid, Greenland melts and the ice melts with the methane underneath it, that can release a tremendous amount of methane. And again, so it's not like we can hit a certain point and say, well, this is it, we've got to really change. But it's like a you know, so-called domino effect. You know, you push one domino and uh, yes. oh, it can go on for miles. Every domino goes down. It's a vicious cycle. They call a positive feedback loop. So that, again, it's essential that we don't let another day go by. We've got to start now. It's not like uh, maybe in five years after this, that, and the other thing. And here's another amazing thing. 195 nations met in Paris at a climate change conference December 2015. Right. 195 nations, Israel, the U.S., all well, the European countries, just about all the countries of the world. And as you know, I think the audience knows, there's so many disputes now. There's a famous saying, if you have two Jews, you have three opinions. That's right. <laughs> I say more. <laughs> right. And 195 nations, some are progressive, some are conservative governments. There's Africa, there's Asia, there's Latin America, there's Muslim countries, there's Israel, there's Christian countries. And yet they all agreed that climate change is human-induced and it's, it's a tremendous threat and it's already causing many problems. The Sandy, the Katrina, the, and almost all those nations agreed that by 2020 or 30, you know, they all have different things, but they're all going to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, so good. that is, 
it's amazing hopefully, that it's happening. Hopefully. Again, it's the <laughs> biggest threat to humanity. We've got to do it. And many things have to be done. More efficient cars. We've got to share rides, public transportation. But without a major shift to vegan diets, there's very little, if any, hope that we're going to avert a climate catastrophe. That's so right. that's why your program is so important. And I, again, urge every listener to be the beginning and tell two people, tell two, three, four, five more, <laughs> and get the word out as much as possible. That's right. Well, here's another quote from Martin Luther King Jr. about everything you just said. On some positions, cowardice asks the questions, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? And vanity comes along and asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must do it because conscience tells him it is right. Absolutely. So we, That's in my book. My, that is in your book. And you reminded me of that quote, and I love that quote. It's, it is so time. And, you know, in, in another quote that's in your book from Pirkei Avot, The Teachings of Our Fathers in Judaism, it is not for you to complete the task of perfecting the world, but neither are you free to desist from doing all that you can to perfect it. So you and I live as idealists. We live the teachings of Judaism. We are, you know, living as if, which is what quantum physics has proven, which is what the Torah talks all about. Live as if, and you will bring about the as if. If you live as if we're living to bring about the Messiah, you've got to live as a vegan. Because if that's what all the Jews want, and that's what everybody wants is an age of peace and freedom, then gosh, we have to live that way now. We can't just pray and hope and talk the talk and then eat brisket on Friday nights. We need to live as if now. Live like we're going to be in the messianic period, which is vegan, yeah. now. That's Absolutely. By the way, you just mentioned the picky about the ethics of the fathers. Yeah. Another teaching from that is, if not now, when? Yes. And that comes right after, that's from Hillel, by the way. Yes. And it comes right after he says, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? But, but, if I'm only for myself, then what am I? And then, if not now, when? Again, by the way, in this book, uh, Who Stole My Religion, Revitalizing Judaism and Applying Jewish Values to Help Heal a Repairable Planet, I argue that Judaism is a radical religion. But in the best sense of radical, was such powerful teachings, justice, justice, shalt thou pursue. Seek peace and pursue it. So the only two things in Judaism that we pursue, you know, there's many mitzvot, most of them at a certain time and place. Uh, you know, if it's uh, Passover, we have the Seder and Matzah and all that. And if it's Sukkot's time, we can build a Sukkot, be outside. But the only thing it says, it's not dependent on a time or a place. Seek peace and pursue it. Tzedek, tzedek, teodolf, or justice, justice, how thou pursue. So again, and of course, vegetarianism is part of that because, again, I, uh, I'm not making it up. I can only build on things. That's why, thankfully, my Judaism and vegetarianism book had pretty good reception because I'm standing and building on the shoulders of giants and pretty much quoting some of the experts and uh, it's part of the t teachings. People, unfortunately, are not always ready to live up to their religion's highest ideals, but as you've been pointing out, very, very strong teachings and uh, we want to bring the messianic period, or at least close to it as possible, it's important to apply these teachings. And I wrote the book because, again, Judaism has the powerful messages. Being in an Orthodox community, many people are doing wonderful, wonderful things, but uh, very few vegetarians or vegans, and uh, people, unfortunately, many in denial about climate change, You've probably heard this expression, denial, denial is not just a river in Egypt. That's and, right. Uh, denial de is not just a river in Egypt, my friends. Stop <laughs> living in it. Do, stop so drowning in it. I'm sorry? Stop, I said stop living in it. Stop drowning in it. Yeah, people yeah. are drowning people, in denial. 
because going along with that idea of denial, most people are rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, in effect, as we head toward a giant iceberg. So part of what you're doing, which is super, super what I'm trying to do, and I hope appealing to people out there again, get involved in all, uh, in, in order to, uh, to make a difference as we, we face, unfortunately, the greatest threat to humanity. And it's not a matter of, well, it'd be a little hotter, it'd be uncomfortable, but, you know, everything we've been talking about, all the flooding, the uh, Sandy, the Katrina, the wildfires in California, uh, the mudslides, the growing desert, it's all due to a temperature increase of one degree Celsius, just a little bit more by now. Okay. And the experts, climate experts, hope we can limit it to two degrees Celsius, which is still double, and that would still be pretty awful. And the reason they say we got to try to limit it to two is that that is still possible because there's a momentum factor. You know, you, you can't, it's, not, it's just like a car, but you put in the brake, it's still going to go forward. Right. Here, too, even if you know, we did the impossible, which is shut down every coal burning power plant tomorrow. Uh, have people walking, biking, and uh, using mass transit, no more cars. Even then, it would go up maybe a half a degree Celsius. And if we did it slowly, it might get up close to that too. But now we are on track for five, four, five, six degrees Celsius, yes. which is possibly an unlivable world. That's right. Yeah. Earthquakes, storm- tsunamis. Yeah, we're on a we're on a collision course with nature. It's true. We've seen the result of it. And it's not from our cars and planes and trains. Well, yes, cloud seeding, chemtrails, it is. It is. That does add to it, but that's a distraction. It is mostly because of what's on the end of our fork. That is why I love what you are talking about. That is what your books are about. That's what your research shows. That's what you preach and promote on every show you can, on this show and others. Yes, carpool, do that. That's not the least of it. I don't even feel bad for driving my Prius because I'm not eating dairy or meat or fish or eggs or animal products. I'm not buying leather. It's really, it's it's consumerism and it's de- supply and demand and it is what is on the end of our fork, you know? And actually that brings me to another question. We've talked about how detrimental it is to human existence, to starving humans to the animals who feel pain and torture it's commanded in the Torah it's taught to take care of our animals all of the righteous beings of Israel Rebecca King David Moses were all chosen specifically because of the way that they treated animals so whether you're hiring a henchman to murder your dinner or not when you buy that that packaged slab of corpse in the supermarket you have in effect, hired a henchman to murder that animal who had a family, a community, children that were ripped away from her to steal her milk and torture her and torture her child for veal. Like, we really need to think, when we say these blessings over our food, which every observant Jew that I know does, I do, when we say these blessings, are we really thinking of where they come from? If you're really, really compassionate and connected to where that food came from, you, I don't call it food. Where that carcass came from, you won't be eating it, okay? So, that, which brings me to another question. Yes, we've talked about it's detrimental to the planet, the animals, and humans, and, and our future. How do you explain to people when they say, but the ritual sacrifices were done in our culture? In the Torah, there are animal sacrifices. Supposedly, it's a mitzvah, which is a good deed, to eat an animal because you elevate its soul. And there's the Corbin Pesach and all of these ritual slaughters. Can you please talk to that? Because that's the question that I get asked a lot when I'm doing my presentations. Right. By the way, in my book, Judaism and Vegetarianism, I have two chapters with questions and answers. The first one is more the Jewish kinds of questions. The other one is more secular, you know, in terms of health and questions like that. And, of course, I address that question. Now, in terms of the sacrifices, one of the greatest Jewish philosophers, if not the greatest, called the Rambam of Maimonides, he indicated that the sacrifices were a concession to the times. That was a common mode of worship done in the ancient times, and he felt in others 
that if they tried not to have that, people would have rejected it. It's like using an analogy of somebody walking into synagogues today and saying, all these prayers, God wants you all to be good to each other, to be kind, to be compassionate. That's the thing. You know, when people are used to a certain way of worshiping, it's not that easy to change. But again, it was a concession uh, to the times and the biblical prophets, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos in Hebrew, they were very strong critics. Uh, they didn't... Uh, or as far as to say, out them completely, but they said that sacrifice if carried out in society that's un, un, unjust and is oppressive and all, that is like somebody praying in a synagogue and then going out and stealing or being very unkind to others. So you have that, and um, the, the temple was destroyed, so we don't have the sacrifice now, and people say that prayers and good deeds take the place of that. That's right. By the way, I have a radical idea that I'm trying to uh, establish. I think you mentioned two bushvat before, but that's a new year for the trees. <laughs> there's, four, <laughs> there's four new years in the Jewish tradition. One of them is so-called new year for the animals. And that ties in with the sacrifice because that was initially for tithing for uh, sacrifices. So my idea is just like two bishvat that died out in the temple, of course, there was no more tithing in terms of fruits from the trees, but that was reestablished. When human beings reestablished something that made a wonderful, wonderful holidays, you know, with all kinds of fruits being eaten and sayings about trees and all kinds of blessings and kavana or real intention. You know, matter of fact, the Kabbalists who reestablished it saw it as a tikkun or a healing. You mentioned tikkun alone before. Tikkun, healing for the fact that Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Anyway, yeah. my idea is just as Tu Bishvat was reestablished after not being much of a holiday for many years, it wasn't needed anymore. The temple was destroyed, 70 in the common era. So to restore the new year for animals, but to transform it into a day devoted to more understanding of Judaism's powerful teachings, compassion for animals. It's called Tzav Chayim, avoiding pain to living creatures. Okay. And so to reestablish it and talk about what we said before, that uh, all the Jewish leaders, as you mentioned, also chosen because of compassion to animals, part of the Ten Commandments, etc. So to understand these teachings and to show how, unfortunately, the realities and factory farms and other settings and how animals are treated so far from this. Because, unfortunately to me, there's so much about the sacrifices, about which animal you can kill, which one you can't, and all. And uh, Judaism has these powerful teachings, but they're, they're not covered that much. So by reestablishing that New Year for animals, it, it can really get to the young people especially to realize that there's no inconsistency. We have this historically. People thousands of years ago maybe needed a sacrifice because that's the only way they knew how to worship. But today we well, certainly yeah. don't. Yeah, and that was pagan also. Just just like circumcision. Sorry, my fellow Jews, if you really look into it, that is a tribal marking. It's like stretching your neck, stretching your earlobes. Circumcision was done by pagans long before Jews did it. I know that our story says that Abraham was up there, you know, and that could have happened, but it was done. It was a practice. It's a tribal marking. It's pagan, just like animal sacrifices. Animal sacrifices were pagan. They were not originally part of the Judeo-Christian world. It was when those Hebrew peoples, the tribal peoples, assimilated. Even They even talk about when during the exodus from Egypt and the 40 years in the desert, manna from heaven was not meat or dairy. The manna from heaven that's described in the Torah is 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 vegetable, herb, vegetable like seed. Like it says, yeah. What does it now, say? It is, by the way, the Jewish sacrifice at least was a big step forward from paganism because, again, within a pagan, they had human sacrifice. That's right. Charles, so there was 
a big increase, and That's also right. it was that you could only do it in one central location. It wasn't like somebody could just go off and say, I'm going to do a sacrifice here. And the feeling was that it was to wean the Israel, Israelites at that time away from the sacrificial services and into more the, uh, the acts of kindness, right. compassion, justice. It was supposed so, to be the gateway. Hmm? Yeah, it was supposed to be the gateway to not murdering at all, yeah. to honoring yeah. the, the Ten Commandment, one of the commandments, which is do not kill. It doesn't say do not kill other humans of your own religion. It says do not kill. That means do not kill animals, do not kill humans, do not kill. There's no amendment to that. Do not kill. Yeah. Just like do yeah. unto others. It says do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. It doesn't say do unto other humans. It says do unto others. Stop torturing, raping, and murdering other animals for your taste buds, which is not even for your health. Animal flesh is the number one killer of life on earth and dairy. So, and their farts with the methane gas and their sewage is the number one cause of global warming, which is, again, the number one cause of human and earth degradation. So, do unto others, do not kill. I champion us as holy people to get back to these tenets of our faith. And I, I love what you stand for, Dr. Schwartz, in championing the same thing. You are my soul, brother. And the six... Yeah, it's... Well, yeah. yeah, well, you to, but one uh, slight uh, modification. It really, the translation is, thou shalt not murder. Because thou shalt not kill, say, well, you're Sorry. being attacked, and uh, society's being destroyed. But So it's, thou shalt not murder. However, right. I've been arguing, thou shalt not murder can be interpreted as, thou shalt not kill unnecessarily. So there's definitely no need to kill animals for a diet. If, this is what Judaism does teach, by the way, if you were stranded on a desert island and there was no other choice, because people, Judaism puts uh, people at a slightly higher level. It says only humans are created in God's image, but this is where I've written some articles, by the way, and I think you mentioned Dominion before. Dominion, and there's two verses in the first chapter of Genesis. One is that we give a dominion, and some people say, well, we do whatever we want. And the other is that only humans are created in God's image. Now, dominion means responsible stewardship. So in a way, uh, it's been misinterpreted. It's just the opposite, and that's where, uh, ideally, if everybody took things the right way, the, uh, the verses in Genesis can be a great help toward animal rights activists in working together rather than feeling there's got to be a split. Right. Unfortunately, some of the religious community don't interpret it positive that way too and maybe think it, we do whatever we want. And in terms of the idea of humans being created in the image of God, that to me means if we create an image of God, we should imitate God's positive attributes yes. of justice and mercy and compassion. Yes. And every day in the synagogue, there's a prayer that says, blessed is the one, meaning God, whose compassion is over the earth, and blessed is the one whose compassion is over the creatures. Yes. So that, uh, and I've written some articles, and by the way, as I mentioned before, jewishbeds.org, slash S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z and appreciate that you're going to be putting this up. In I'm going to put it in, I'm going to put it in the paragraph. It'll be written down below. Oh, okay. It's down below. <laughs> we're, we're going to get your info out there for sure. Thank you though for reminding us. But no, as far, I, I mean, Maimonides said this, one of our great Jewish leaders, one of the great leaders of humanity, as far as pain is concerned, there is no real distinction between the pain of humans and the pain of animals because the love and compassion of the mother for her young is not reasoned intellectually, but has only to do with emotions and instincts which are found among animals no less than among human beings. It is so true, God breathed souls into animals as well, when I hear this weird argument sometimes from very holy people that only humans have a soul, I, I'm aghast because I've read the Torah and there's a nefesh chaya, a living soul, that was applied to animals as well as people. 
It is clear. It is written in black and white in the Torah. I have read it. I've read it in Hebrew. I've read it in English. Wake up, my lovely people. Wake up. Uh, many Torah laws mandate the proper treatment of animals, and only by acting as if and treating these animals with compassion can we truly bring about the Messiah. So, and I'd love to read another quote by another hero of mine, Dr. Will Tuttle, who wrote The World Peace Diet. Right. Yeah, you know him. He, he's amazing. He says, as long as we remain at the core, a culture that sees animals merely as commodities and food, there is little hope for our survival. The systematic practice of ignoring, oppressing, and excluding that is fundamental to our daily meals disconnects us from our inner wisdom and from our sense of belonging to a benevolent and blessed universe. By actively ignoring the truth of our interconnectedness, we inescapably commit genocide and suicide and forsake the innate compassion and the intelligence that would guide us. Dr. Will Tuttle. See, you like me, I love quotations. I know, I, we're kindred spirits, I tell you, Richard, we're kindred spirits. Our compassion is suppressed by eating animals. Our compassion is suppressed yeah. when we that eat. Is true. That is true. By the way, you mentioned before of animals and souls. If people believe they don't have a soul, then they should treat them even better because that means this is it, this is the world, this is all the animals have. So they should be treated decently on this earth. Wow. So there's, there's so many arguments there that, uh, and by the way, tying in just a little bit more on the idea of dominion being responsible stewardship, right after in the Torah, it indicates people have dominion. Shortly after, a couple of verses later, it says that, we mentioned before, God's initial completely vegan Dietary regimen is indicated. Yep. Then in the next chapter, there's a very powerful verse 2 that ties in with everything we've been saying. Chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 15, says the human being was put into the Garden of Eden to work the land, but also to guard it. Yeah. So we're to be Shomri and Dhamma, guardians of the earth. Basically. Amen. Amen, my, amen, my brother. Increased <laughs> compassion for all of God's creatures will lead to a greater appreciation of our Creator and hence to a greater commitment to performing all of God's good deeds. And finally, to that ideal time of justice, compassion, and harmony that represents the messianic vision. The lion will lay down with the lamb. There will be peace on earth. These hurting tribal cultures will not be warring and fighting. Everything will be peaceful and just and harmonious. We won't be having asthma from breathing in sewage slush from factory farms. And we will be honoring all of the six Jewish and every other ideology's mandates, which you I'm so... Peace, peace a chance. Give peace a chance. Treat animals compassionately. I'm just going to read the six basic Jewish mandates that I've read in every religion by different names. Treat animals compassionately. Preserve human health protect the environment, conserve natural resources, help the hungry, and seek and pursue peace. Lechem and Milchama. Those six Jewish basic mandates transcend into every culture and every ism I've ever studied. And by not eating animal products and not buying in to that corporate structure that dominates, suppresses, tortures, and murders them for our taste buds, we will actually be bringing these six mandates about. Amen. Give oh, peas a chance. Give peas a chance. Snap peas. Split pea. Whatever. Any kind of pea. English pea pods. Give peas a chance. Yeah. You mentioned uh, chickpeas. Chickpeas! Uh, oh my gosh, it's the main pea. Hello, we're Jews. Chickpeas. You know, with all this trouble in the Middle East, you know, there's a place with... Uh, it was the Lapo and Hummus in the Negev, and they came up with this idea of trying to bring pe people together. They said if a Jew and a Muslim sits down at the same table at a time when there was sort of violence, that they, they would be only charged half price. I love that. <laughs> that the idea, if all we're saying is give chickpeas a chance. I love that. Oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh, Dr. Richard Schwartz, you are such an incredible human. You are an angel on earth. 
Thank you so much for your beautiful inspiration. I'm going to put all the links where people can find you and read about you and read your inspired visionary writings down below here in the description. And they will find you and they will reach out. Please, God. Is there anything else you would like to say in our farewell to our viewers? <laughs> well, again, that the world, unfortunately, unfortunately, is challenged as never before, and the fate of future of humanity is at stake, the kind of world uh, children, grandchildren, future generations have is at stake. And there's wonder, you know, it's not, a, I hope I'm not giving this idea that uh, we have to sacrifice for the future, because as you know, there's so many wonderful, delicious vegan foods, more and more it has been an upsurge. By the way, Israel is the leading country in the world in terms of percent of the population being vegan. I heard that. It's, 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 yeah, it's really amazing. It's still relatively low, but it's the highest in the world, and hopefully it's moving in the right direction. So the thing is that by shifting to a vegan diet, you're doing the most you can for animals, for your own health, for the environment, for the proper use of resources to reduce hunger, to reduce violence in the world and have a more peaceful world. So it's really a wonderful, wonderful thing to do for yourself to you feel much better about yourself, to you feel you're, you're doing, every day you're doing something, a little bit. As you said before, Abby, it's not ours if you vote, as with the Protestant, not ours to complete the task, but we're not uh, uh, not permitted to not do everything we possibly can. So Amen. again, uh, please share this message, get it out to as many as possible, so that we can all have a wonderful, wonderful world in the future. So oh, thank man. you for having me on this program. Really great. Thank you for being here. As you are the living, vibrating example of Einstein's <laughs> message, Nothing will benefit health and increase the chance for survival on Earth as the evolution to a vegan diet. He meant vegan. That, he was a vegan. Was that he just, Einstein, there was no way that quote? What? I thought, was that Albert Einstein's quote? Albert Einstein. Yeah. Nothing, okay. nothing will He's benefit so it more. And George Bernard Shaw, while our bodies are the living graves of murdered animals, how can we expect any ideal conditions on Earth? We become what we eat, we are what we eat, we reap what we sow, sow peace at the end of your forks, and feel peace in your hearts, and channel it all around, and start at home, as Dr. Richard Schwartz has done in his own community, start with your community, start with yourself, read his, his compilations, and enjoy them, because they are deep, and wise, and profound, and thought-provoking, I champion you to read them, get them into your heart, as they say, the Shema, put it upon your heart. And you will become a more compassionate person and you'll just feel better. No depression. Depression comes from eating all those corpses. But anyway, that's another video. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Richard Schwartz. You are my real-life hero. You are amazing. Keep fighting the good fight. And may the Schwartz be with you. Oh, it's been a pleasure <laughs> to be on the program. Thank you and best wishes for continued success. We need many, many more like you. Thank you, Angel. We'll see you soon. We'll be back.